November 16, 1989. From ABC News. Primetime Live from New York continues. Once again, Diane Sawyer. Our studios here in New York are actually about half a block away from Central Park. But look again. With the help of technology and the magicians in our control room, I can take a walk through the leaves, the rain, and never leave our New York studio. But of all the Merlins of special effects, there remains one man who is the acknowledged master, George Lucas, who has helped create six of the ten top grossing films in U.S. history. With Star Wars, Lucas became to the current generation what Walt Disney was to the last. We wanted you to meet him, even though we heard that he's shy and quiet and rarely grants access to his private kingdom. But tonight, we are going to take you there, to Skywalker Ranch, where ordinary people can imagine the most impossible things. In a very nice galaxy, a very nice average young man had a happy, ordinary childhood. And then, something happened. Part of movies is not showing things the way they are. It's showing them the way you'd like them to be. That's the fantasy of it. And does your heart sink when you put in front of an audience and they sit there like lumps? Yeah. Uh, having a preview of your movie for the first time is, is worse than a first date. I mean, it's really intense. <laughs> There's nothing worse <laughs> than a first date. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, because everything you worked on for years, you know, many millions of dollars, everything is at stake. One, two, three o'clock, four... But you don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about George Lucas. So far, he's directed, written, or produced a lot of America's top-grossing movies. Hits that have financed a bucolic kingdom in the hills outside San Francisco. This is the, uh, the outgrowth of a frustrated architect that ends up with more money than he needs. Is this a boy's idea of paradise? In a way, it is. I need a rural environment in which to work. I get my best ideas, being able to walk around and enjoy myself. Skywalker Ranch looks like a kinder, gentler falcon crest, but every one of these doors conceals an Alice in Wonderland world of fantasy. Just as Lucas's friendly face conceals the universe within, an imagination inhabited by the hairiest, cuddliest, slimiest, ugliest things you've ever seen. These are the people who bring all those creatures to life. The unit is called Industrial Light and Magic, and they're the reigning masters of special effects. Okay. You can see their handiwork not only in Lucas's films, but how about that train in Out of Africa? It was, in fact, a toy train. Or the Statue of Liberty in Ghostbusters 2. And here's something you haven't seen yet. It will be in a new movie, Back to the Future Part 2. They start out with a real floating car, hoist by invisible wires. But to make it fly through the skies above the horizon takes a few tricks of the trade. The sky and the horizon are simply a painted background. The car is a model so authentic it took three months to build. You got tail lights, wheels, interior lights, uh you got headlights. A computer has been programmed to rock the car and turn the wheels, while a special computerized camera rocks and turns as well, so that together they chart a convincing course across that painted sky. But ask the masters of special effects which one astonishes even them, and they'll all tell you this one. The watery pseudopod from the abyss. It's entirely a computer creation, painstakingly crafted to slither and move by millions of computer calculations. It's trying to communicate. 
Lucas believes what communicates and thrills on the movie screen can be used to communicate and teach in the classroom. He's putting together a series of interactive computer systems to help excite all the kids he feels standard teaching techniques leave behind. One of them, the map wrap, developed with the National Geographic Society. When the U.S. fought the Revolutionary War, 13 colonies bordered our eastern shore. Lucas says kids who are used to interaction will learn much faster this way than by books alone, including a kid the system never reached decades ago. Would this have got the young George Lucas out of his D's and C's? I think so. Really? Quite frankly, yeah. I had a lot of friends, and I was interested in cars. Did you really ride around gunning the motor with Vaseline on your hair and yeah. looking tough? <laughs> Ooh, right? Well, I don't look that tough, but it was <laughs> definitely a way of spending one's life. Lucas took those memories of adolescence in the tranquil 50s and early 60s and turned them into a coming-of-age classic, American Graffiti, a film that launched a generation of young actors. How'd you like to ride around with me for a while? I'm sorry, I can't. I'm going steady. And we're the only culture that mates in cars. It's a very American kind of thing. Did you, did you get girls? Yeah. In the 50s? I did. So it's not enough. <laughs> but uh, I don't think there ever is enough when you're 16. It was innocent, wasn't it? Well, it's an innocent movie. They were innocent times. The film is about innocence. In some ways, Lucas is still trying to recapture that innocence for all the kids who have grown up without it, whose parents got lost in the ambivalence and cynicism of the 60s. His Star Wars trilogy was a series of carefully crafted myths about friendship, loyalty, and the way we choose the kind of person we're going to be. I think the world is not as um, supportive today as it was in the 50s and the 60s. And I don't think there's much, as much emotional support. So you set out to make a film about values. Yeah, yeah. I basically set out to make a modern fairy tale. And good then, guys, bad guys, yeah. and teach you how to live. And it's not a teaching as much as it is as you get a sense of it, rather than a direct, you know, thou shalt not. It's much more of a, I don't think I will. Is there a point in any of the three of them at which you still feel your heart pounding every time you see it? Um, well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're all personal moments. And, filmmaking moments, so to speak, I think. For instance? Well, I still get a, a shiver up my back every time uh, uh, Luke and his father are, confront themselves in that final battle. There's a moment there with a, a few shots, a series of shots, some wonderful score by Johnny Williams. It's just sort of magical. This takes us behind the final door in the kingdom of George Lucas, where another one of his wizards is at work, the wizard of sound, Ben Burt. So you have all the sounds of the universe here? Uh, the known universe, yes, as far as we know at this point. So it really is very godlike, isn't it, to orchestrate your own wind and then orchestrate your lightning? No, I, I wouldn't go that far to say that, but we often say hearing is believing, and the sounds that we put in will often give the reality or the dramatic reality to something that uh, otherwise would be somewhat lifeless. Lucas is such a sound perfectionist, he's even going door to door, selling his own system, THX, to individual theaters so that the audience can hear every carefully programmed rattle and squeal. Oh, rats. Show me. Well, we have a scene with rats in, in, in this film, and Indiana Jones encounters thousands of rats in the sewers under Venice. Uh, of course, we had real rats here, but they didn't really vocalize. But people have an idea that rats do well, make you sounds. Well, we wanted that, yes, you want, well, rats do make sounds, but when you get 2,000 rats together, they are pretty quiet. I guess they're content. But in, uh, <laughs> what we wanted to do is create a sense of uh, rat gibberish, rat chatter. It sounded threatening and maybe somewhat slimy. Um, one of the things which ended up being used principally was, in fact, this sound. <laughs> Now, that's, that's actually a chicken riot recording well, yes. a group of chickens, but you play on the upper scale here. Oh. 
chickens become chattering rats. At any moment, you might be hearing hundreds of sounds at once, 40 to 50 different tracks running at the same time. If you want to hear the difference, this is a section of Raiders of the Lost Ark with dialogue alone. Give him the whip. Throw me the idol. No time to argue. Throw me the idol. I throw you the whip. Give me the whip. Adios, senor. And now, after the sound has been meticulously layered in. Give me the whip. Throw me the idol. No time to argue. Throw me the idol. I throw you the whip. Give me the whip. Adios, senor. So the guy who used to conjure up Ewoks and droids and Wookiees is now managing a creative empire. It's almost perfect, except it seems not even a wizard can work magic on his private life. The exterior facade of things doesn't necessarily make one happy. Lucas and his wife went through an expensive divorce several years ago, and his most publicized romance with Linda Ronstadt is now more off again than on. Life is full of conflicts. Um, I think, um, I, I would say that I'm relatively happy. What would make I got, it perfect? Well, I don't know. I, got, I guess I got two wonderful little girls, which are the most important thing to me. I'd love to have a wife. That's uh, always an issue. I'd like to share my life with somebody. But, um, I haven't found and there's, no, nah, life is not always as easy as one would uh, hope. But for a man like Lucas, there's always that other world, where things are as you wish they would be. He's going to write and direct a new movie about caring, he says, and produce another three in the Star Wars cycle. Returning to a world where a simple kid with a few resources can turn off the computers, follow his feelings, and seize his destiny. Do you still believe that you can turn off the computer and trust your feelings? Yeah, I do. And for you, right now, if you turned off the computers and trusted your feelings, what would you be doing? This? Yeah. <laughs>